Hi, I'm Kurt Fernley, Paralympian and proud person with a disability. And I'm Sarah Shands, mum of a kid with a disability who loves life. Can you tell me a cool thing about deaf people in Australia? We have Auslan choirs where we sing with our hands. Auslan choirs are amazing. I think I was about five years old, sitting in my sandpit playing, and I loved that sandpit. It was the summer holidays. And that dry heat of Western New South Wales was baked into the ground. My cousins were over and everyone was getting ready to catch some rabbits. Yeah, I grew up in the 80s, but it was more like the 1950s. My mum came over and I was dusting the sand off my hands and said I couldn't go. That I had to stay behind with the grown-ups. Well, they went back inside and then all the kids took off with the dogs. And I was left alone, sitting in that sandpit, devastated. Being out on the farm catching rabbits with my cousins and brothers, that was the best fun. So I started crawling after them. I had tears and snot streaming down my face and I was calling out for them to wait. If they'd just wait for me, to catch up. It'll all be okay. Then I heard footsteps crunch in the dry grass. It was my older brother. He towered over me, blocking out the sun and said, would you hurry up? You know that you can do anything. So come on, let's get going. I climbed up on his shoulders and we did catch up with my cousin. And he told me it was my job to hold on to the dogs. And that is exactly what I did. I ended up getting dragged all over the place holding on to those things. My brother asked me later on, why didn't you let go? Because he knew he was gonna have to pay for all the cuts and bruises. And I said to him that, you told me I could do anything and I was never going to let go of those things. In moments like these and choices my brother made all those years ago that showed me that my place, it was with them. Crashing through the bush, bumped, bruised and deliriously happy. So one thing that I was not prepared for as a parent of a child with disability was the conversation where she told me that she doesn't want to have a disability, that she wishes she was normal. I can't tell you how hard that was to hear. Yeah, I've had that conversation with my mum. I knew I was different. There were things that everyone did that I just couldn't. And that was hard. So let's talk about ableism, the social model of disability and disability pride. Have you ever found yourself thinking, oh, look at that poor disabled person. Their life must be so hard. I just couldn't live like that. Or maybe you've overheard a conversation at the school gate where parents are complaining about a difficult child that doesn't belong at their school. The way you see people with a disability matters because it will shape how you interact with us. And this is important because it shapes, in part, how we see ourselves. Often people with disability are seen with sympathy or fear. And sometimes we are told that we just don't belong. Jax Brown is an LGBTIQA plus disability activist and educator and grew up in a small country town. Jax explains what it was like for them growing up. I was my my parents' first real encounter with disability and the messages that they got right from day one all the way through my childhood was that disability was this terrible thing that had befallen them 
and that had befallen me and they must do all that they could to try and normalise my body as much as possible to try and get me to the point where I could go to mainstream school but with a focus on minimising my disability as much as possible. I've had medical professionals trying to minimise my disability my entire life. When I was little, my mum was told that my legs should be cut off and prosthesis fitted so I could stand. Not walk, just stand. All with the aim of making me look more normal. When Jack's became a parent, they started to reflect on the impact that the medical community's views had on how their parents saw them. I did a lot of thinking about what that must have felt like for them to be thrown into that world of disability as this terrible unknown. And the only voices you're hearing are the medical profession saying, this is this terrible, horrible thing. And if you do everything we tell you to do, maybe your child can have, you know, a slightly better life, but they'll still have this terrible affliction hanging around their neck kind of thing. So, so throughout my childhood, that was definitely the narrative that I was given about what my body meant and what my disability meant. And I had a lot of intense therapies every day and a lot of kind of normalisation procedures to try and make me look less disabled. One day, completely by chance, I was sitting next to the great Stella Young on a flight and she introduced me to the social model of disability. This idea says that I'm not disabled because I'm in a wheelchair. I'm disabled because of the way society is built and your expectations about what I can or can't do. As I was processing this idea for the very first time, Stella looked at me and said, oh my God, it's like watching a baby fawn find their feet. We laughed, but that conversation changed me. And when Jax discovered the social model of disability, it changed their life. I found this book on the social model and the history of disability rights. And looking back, it wasn't, you know, the most radical book, but it really, shifted my mindset and I started to kind of go out into my small country town where a lot of the buildings were heritage listed and not accessible and think about what could the world look like if we thought about disability differently, if we prioritised access, if we didn't frame the problem of disability as an individual personal problem but as a socio-political problem. And then I happened to make a friend. I made a friend with a woman who was a number of years older than me who also had a physical disability and who was also kind of trying to rethink what this meant for her. And having somebody I could talk to and read books with and discuss ideas with and feel like she got it and I got it and it didn't matter if the rest of the world didn't understand it in the ways we were understanding it now, that was super important. But the social model of disability isn't perfect. For people living with chronic pain or intellectual disability, it doesn't really change very much for them. And while it would go a long way to make life better for lots of people with disability, I think we need to acknowledge the parts of the disability community that it doesn't quite work for. So what is it about how disability has been viewed in the past that shapes what we think today? Associate Professor Lorna Hallerahan prepared a report for the Disability Royal Commission, which looked at the history of disability policy in Australia. The sorts of policies and mechanisms that we've used to sequester people have changed over time, gone from prisons to mental health asylums to disability-specific institutional settings through to smaller organisations. But we, I could see that there was this this impulse of expulsion about how do we gather people up and where do we put them and we justify that on the basis of doing the right thing for those people. But the more that we listen to what comes out of those settings, the more that we realise that these are sites of maltreatment. When a child is born with a disability, their parents are often told with an apology. I'm sorry, your child has a disability and it sets a tone for that family. They are off on a course of trying to fix something about their child, and that's not the right message to give parents or children. Disability is just one part of who you are, and I think that's sometimes lost when you're surrounded by people trying to fix you. 
And I reckon most Australians think that we have an inclusive society, but we do still practice segregation. Exclusion often starts at early childhood education with kids as young as three. They're told for the first time that there isn't a place for them with the other neighbourhood kids. Giving that message, that rejection message, you are not worthy, you do not belong in the world of children or of the wider community, has a very strong potential to cause people shame. So that's the connection. The way that I think about it is that shame is the voice of rejection whispered in the inner ear that says, I am not worthy. Oh, this is one of the things that keeps me awake at night. Because society has this inherently negative view of disability, this may influence how my kid sees themselves. But something that has really helped has been taking the time to listen and connect with other people with disability. In particular, deaf adults. And the thing that comes across again and again is that my family need to learn Auslan to give us all access to deaf culture and the amazing deaf community here in Australia. Things I know now as a proud person with a disability are things that would have really helped 14-year-old Kurt, who was having a pretty tough time and getting to the point that I'm at, practising disability pride, well, it was a pretty long path. Would I change anything? Absolutely not. Lara McFarlane is an artist and disability activist who initially felt like they needed to hide their disability. Before my brain injury, I was quite involved in community and grassroots activism, in environmental activism particularly. And so I think when I found my self disabled, I felt really, really shocked at the way we were treated. And I didn't see anyone speaking back. And I now think they were so institutionalised in disability services that we didn't even have the ability to make our own a cup of tea or have a, make a decision around that. I used to look around me in my institutional settings and in my self-advocacy groups and I'd see really powerful people. But as soon as we walked outside the door, we weren't being given that respect. I was really interested early on too about the shame I felt. I similarly felt pressure to hide it. Ableism is something that I wrestle with. It's this thing that you do and you probably don't even realise that you're doing it, but you try to fix me or make assumptions about what I can or can't do. Internalised ableism is even tougher to break through because I think that about me. When I come across a set of stairs that I think it's my problem that I can't get up them because there's something wrong with me. Internalised ableism expresses itself as shame. But it's not real shame because you haven't done anything wrong. You're internalising the attitudes of society and society does not value disability. So it suddenly made sense now why I had this shame. And then I realised it it definitely wasn't my shame and that the antidote to it was to embrace disability. So around that time, I also learned about disability pride. And by embracing my identity as disabled, it would give me a stronger voice. Aki No is a model and disability activist. They found disability pride when they started working in this community. I'm proud of who I am just as I am, even if that includes a body that doesn't work the way that you think it should work. And it's It it includes living in pain. Yes, I would choose not to live in pain, but I don't have that choice. So why can't I just be happy with who I am and live my life and do all the things that I want to do and be be out there and be happy with who I am and not stress about all these preconceived notions of how I should be? Creating more inclusive communities will have huge benefits, not just for people with disability, but for all the non-disabled folks too. Let's look at how First Nations Australians did disability. Dr Scott Avery is the Senior Lecturer in the School of Social Sciences at the University of Western Sydney and is also a profoundly deaf Waramai man. There's this archaeological site out at Lake Mungo. There's this single right line footprint. So it goes right footprint, right footprint, right footprint, no corresponding left footprint. 
and the archaeologists who went and uh, looked at that were kind of a bit baffled why so they asked the elders, it's, not, it's a one-legged man and they're on a hunt. And the reason we tell that story, it's actually emblematic of the Indigenous cultures of inclusion. There's no word for disability in Indigenous cultures. But it's this idea that people are valued and respected for their inherent worth. The fight for inclusion burns deep inside most people with disability and it sits alongside any shame that a person may feel. And I think that we shouldn't let the shame and the trauma that we can feel dominate us. Lorna Hallorahan has mulled over this idea. And so every person who experiences that brings a gift to us, which is often the silenced gift of hope and of desire for something different. And I believe that that sits there always, even though we may not be able to see it. And sometimes in solidarity, we have to carry that hope for people as they begin to sort of spread those wings and let them dry and then see what it feels like to lift themselves with them. And that is different from being gathered up and segregated from the mainstream. It's finding belonging on your own terms in your own way, through sharing your experience. But this journey isn't easy and often the community doesn't help. Scott Avery again. This young Aboriginal man, he said, look, uh, part of my employment, I've got to go into town and speak with a clinical psychologist because I'm on on an employment um, support program. And that's great while I'm in there the 20 minutes, but then I walk out. I can't get the bus, the bus won't stop for me. So I've got to walk home and then the name calling starts and I come here And again, I'm surrounded by it, but right at the end, and he sort of points to his chest right there and goes, I know there's something stronger here. I've just got to get here. This kind of intangible of hope still sits there. Within our grasp are antidotes to the shame and trauma that may come with disability. Adopting the social model of disability, that is, It's not my disability that is preventing me from getting into that building. Society is preventing that because they didn't build a ramp. It neutralises ableism and all the horrible things that accompany it. And the disability pride movement goes a long way in dealing with internalised ableism that eats away at people's self-worth. But it can't just be people with disability left fighting for inclusion on their own. We need the whole community to see us as we are. Embrace us for who we are. And see that we have a place in your schools, workplaces and pubs. So come on, it's time to let us in. For more Auslan versions of the podcast series, Let Us In, subscribe to the ABC Australia YouTube channel.